Hi, this is Cindy Liu here, joined with Melissa Goble. And today we're going to do kind of a deeper dive on compensation committees and working with the board. Uh, Melissa is a global CHRO, and I'm going to have her introduce herself in a second. But um, I think uh, the reason we started this conversation was we were just talking about how there's so little out there for uh, CHROs when it comes to working with the compensation committee and or running the compensation committee and working with the board. Melissa, I'd love to hear your story behind that. There are, there is just so, there's such little information. And from our conversation, Cindy, I did a couple, you know, I did some searches. There's a lot of information out there about what a compensation committee is, how they work, especially in different types of, you know, for it's public, private, or nonprofit. But when I searched, how does the CHRO work with this comp committee? Even looking in places that you would think that there would be information like SHRM or something, I didn't find anything. Um, there's just not a lot of information. And I know from when I first became a CHRO, I didn't know. I didn't know. And so you stub your toe along the way and you learn really fast um, what you need to do. Uh, but as you and I were talking, I mean, after almost nine years of being a CHRO uh, for a nonprofit membership organization, I learned a lot. And I think it's just helpful if we if we share. Yeah, well, hopefully we can keep some other people from stubbing their toes and um, help them leapfrog this challenge. Um, just to give the audience some context, yes. um, tell us a little bit about your background and your experience as a CHRO. I will, absolutely. So my background is um, I rose through the ranks of HR, but always in for-profit. And then I had an opportunity to go be the CHRO for YPO, which is a membership organization, and it's nonprofit. So uh, when I moved into that position, it was different already because I was going from for-profit to non-for-profit. So there, there's a big change. However, with the board structures, there's a lot of similarity when you look across, uh, whether it's public, private, or not-for-profit, there's a lot of similarities. Yeah, yeah. give us a little uh, background on the scope of YPI. I know it's global. How many countries and, or at least when you were there? Sure, sure. So they have over, uh, and YP, many people don't know who YPO is. Um, YPO is, used to be formerly Young Presidents Organization, and it is a global membership organization for individuals who, re who reach success early in their careers. So in order to join, you have to be a CEO or you know, sometimes they're called presidents or managing directors, and you have to be under the age of 45. And so it was created to be a peer network um, because CEOs have really lonely jobs. I mean, who are they going to talk to? Um, and so it was formed out of that. And it is global across 142 countries, I believe, at this time. Well, and I would argue that maybe the CHRO actually has the lonelier job. In fact, um, <laughs> that's how Melissa and I got to know each other. She uh, um, met her initially when she was speaking on a panel, but um, she's been a member of our HR mastermind groups for six years now so since the beginning yeah. since that's the beginning. right it's you been were a founding to be a part of the group since the beginning and what a resource yeah what an amazing group well awesome let's dive in by I'd love to hear how you stubbed your toe like how did this all start and what's it you know look like when when you're not well prepared and didn't have a mentor like you you know to to talk to and and learn from so I think the um, I'll talk about when I first started uh, managing this, the comp, comp committee. Um, we had our first meeting, and I think I, I want to set the context. So within YPO, it's a membership-run organization. So there's lots of committees, and it's common every day for so many of the of the employees, the people who work there, the associates, to work with members and to work on committees. So me coming in, I just didn't know. Um, and I had talked with my CEO and, you know, I think he thought he had prepared me, um, but I just didn't know what I didn't know. So in the first meeting, you know, I'd, I don't, I didn't really recognize that I needed to prep the chair. Um, they were welcoming me. Um, we had, I, I just, I, I was there thinking I was just there, you know, just as a member not as the person who was really organizing it and bringing things together and bringing things to the forefront. So we had a couple of uh, meetings along those lines, uh, not very many, but the chair called me at one point and goes, Melissa, do you understand that 
you're, this is your job to manage all of this. And I mean, it's not my job. I'm just the chair, but you need to prep me to get to this. You need to do this and do that. And I was like, you know, thank you very much. This is a hard conversation, but I appreciate the fact that you're willing to have it. Um, and that, you know, just some light bulbs went off uh, very quickly. And I began to really um, focus in on how I needed to really reframe my mind in what the compensation committee was for me. Yeah. And that was, they were a customer. I think this is a common challenge, right? Um, whether it's for new CHROs, first time stepping into the board, or um, even experienced CHROs who are getting their first you know, chance at uh, working with the board. Um, so it's a fairly common story th that I have heard, so. Well, thank you for making yeah, me feel yeah. better. <laughs> yeah. What what uh, what does good look like? Good looks like good looks like you've really you've good looks like you've got the plan mapped out for the year. So in for compensation committees, typically their bylaws or their charters indicate that they are going to meet at least a minimum of two times a year. Because comp committees are they're really fiduciary committees and they're a subcommittee of the board. So typically their focus is on um, CEO compensation. It's on the compensation of the executives. They will have some responsibility for looking at overall benefits for uh, the company. They're thinking about retention and attraction. That, that's their overall thing, but they're not, they're not into the details because the members of the comp committee, they don't work in the business. They don't work in the organization. They're independent directors. And so they come to the committee with different perspectives and experiences. They know what they know, just like you don't know what you don't know. As I've already shared with you what I don't know uh, or didn't know, but that's what they bring to the table. They bring that richness of what they know. And some of them are um, some of them know a lot about compensation, and in my case, it was on a global scale, and some of them didn't. They were from smaller organizations or, you know, domestic to one particular country, and so they were learning along the way, too. <clears throat> but it's important to remember that as you frame it out, that they are individuals who come in and out. So the board meetings and the comp committee meetings don't go on all the time. They happen periodically through time. So it's kind of like if you came in and out of a movie, you don't remember, you don't know what scene just happened and you don't know what's coming up next. You're just in and out of the movie. And really as the, as the person who's managing the comp committee, you're the one who's going, okay, this is just what happened. You know, like the, the guy just walked in the room and they're getting ready to do such and such and stuff. They go, okay, yeah, I'm ready to go. Yeah, it sounds like when we watch movies as a family, I'm like up into the kitchen, off, and then I have to come back. My whole family has to be like, okay, this is what happened. That's right. If they're not yeah. willing to rewind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so that's interesting. So some of them, a lot of board members don't have this experience, which is always uh, very interesting to me when I see non-HR executives on boards and being the head of, you know, the comp committee. Um, or the chair of the comp committee. It's it's uh, interesting, and I I'm curious, um, just how valuable it was probably to have somebody who actually could answer their questions, right, and be that person to provide that in between meetings support. So so good looks like you've got the year mapped out, and you got the year mapped out. You're communicating well. You built a good relationship with your chair. Good looks like you have. Um, met with the different board of directors that are on your on your committee. You've talked with them. You've made sure that they've had a really good onboarding experience. So they know what you've done. You know, like if they're just coming in, you've explained what already happened in the meet in the in the movie, if you will, to go back to that analogy. Yeah. Uh, and so one of the things that I always kept running was a list of decisions that have been made. Mm -hmm. And I would share that with them. So over time, it got to be, you know, a pretty long document. But I could say, these are the decisions. This is where we've been. So you're coming in here, but this is where we've been. If you want to look at this, we would, of course, talk about it. Um, so that they would understand the foundation that had been built. And here's what's coming up. Here's the challenges that we're facing. Here's some things that you might hear about. Or here's some things that you may want to think about. Or I can provide you more information. 
Um, I love that. Is there, was there a name that you called that document? Like, uh, the history. Previous decisions. <laughs> previous decisions, yeah. <laughs> Pre no, but I, I love that. It's, because it's other... really exciting. It's pre called previous decisions. Um, and I would have it by each fiscal year of the decisions that were made. Yeah. And there's the ones that are fiduciary, which you're always making um, every year. Like what is the compensation for the CEO? What are you approving for their direct reports? Um, but through my tenure in that role, we had a lot going on because we really rebuilt HR. Um, we re-looked at the compensation philosophy. What should it be? Lots of conversations around that. Um, sought out a, compens a new compensation partner. And that was a very interesting approach because we did not have, early on, we didn't have full compensation plans on a global scale. So needed to go out and find um, comp a compensation partner to help us build that out because you'd have the same position in different places. So you could have a position who's doing the same thing in New York that they're doing in Mumbai or they're doing in Sydney or they're doing in um, Sao Paulo. But how are you going to how are you going to keep that level and, and have equity um, because you're basing it in the market? So we had to go out and find a really good comp partner. And the comp partner, um, just to kind of switch over to that, the mm -hmm. comp partner is really a key part, I found mm -hmm. in my experience. And it was something that I I worked with the compensation committee on. And the fact that I did an RFI, I did an RFP, excuse me, I did an mm -hmm. RFP. I interviewed a number of them. And then before I moved forward with selecting one, I went back to the comp committee and I said, this is, this is what, you know, this is what I've done. This is what I've learned. Is there anything that you're thinking about that I may have missed? Is there anything that you want that I can incorporate into this? That's um, so good. Yeah. yeah, because, because we all, we all use them as a resource and um, so then I ended up bringing, I ended up getting a relationship with a, with a comp partner who is an excellent comp partner. And the rep, she would join our meetings. Um, we also at one point made sure that the comp committee felt they could reach out and contact them as well. So I'm curious, you said we all use the, use them, you know, the comp partners. Um, what, were there any board members or committee members who were like, why do we need to go and get an external compensation study? Did you run into that? No, they weren't, no. that wasn't the part that, um, okay. that they got that. Where we, no, it was the, if they found out exactly how much it cost. <laughs> 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 there is, um, I remember my CFO going, I don't know, but that compensation, compensation data is very expensive. And to do it really, really well, it's an expensive product. It's, it's an expensive, it's expensive, but it's really an investment. It's investment into yeah. having a really healthy, healthy data so that you're making really good decisions okay. and that you and the comp committee and your employees can have confidence that you're really doing the right thing. Or how much more expensive is paying a search firm to find a new CEO or CFO or CIO or CHRO or the turnover that that we've seen happen. Right. In the market. Yeah. yeah, yeah, or for, or for people feeling like they're underpaid. Yeah, um, yeah. So coaching them on it's an investment, not an it expense. is an investment. It is an investment because um, you just want to do it well. You want to do it to the best of your ability and the best that you can afford. Yeah, I kind of feel like that could be a whole post blog post just on <laughs> convincing organizations that. Maybe don't get that. Yeah. Um, so, so backing up, um, just you know, as a CHRO, you're juggling a lot of, you know, things at once. Um, how did you think about your board and your committee from a CHRO perspective? How did you frame it in your mind? I framed them as a customer. Okay. I framed them as a customer um, and a partner. But more than anything, they were my customer because they their time was limited as they were coming in and out of the movie, to go back and use that analogy. And I was framing it into thinking about what they might need and how I might need to communicate. And it is heavy focus on communication. 
you really can't over communicate. Um, because if you have long stretches in between when you have meetings, then, you know, how many of us can remember what we had for breakfast yesterday? Um, when you add that into being a couple of months, you know, it's like, okay, now what are we doing? How do we do it? And so really refreshing that, getting that back up to speed to say, here's where we are. Here's what you need to know. Mm -hmm. um, and Cindy, you and I had, um, you said something the other day when we were talking about this, about how, you know, we really have to be succinct in what we say. You know, if uh, our peers will listen to so much, our employees will listen to so much, our, our CEOs want a one pager, well, your board committee members, they want a couple of bullets. And so you have to, in the desire to be helpful and thinking of them as the customer, I know I wanted to make sure that they had all the information that they needed. And this was another learning uh, for me because I would provide too much. And they would say, look, look, Nelson, we don't need to know how to build the clock. Just tell us what time it is because we, you know, by then I'd built the trust. They're like, just tell me what time it is. I just don't want to, I don't need all of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, it was an interesting true. thing because we're, you know, as you raised up in HR, you're thought to be thorough and detailed and you want to make sure you have the answers. And, and when you get to this point, you have the answers, you just need to give them. And what about other people? I mean, obviously compensation is not just the CHROs, um, you know, I mean, you're the point on it, but what about other executives? How do you bring them in to the conversation? What was your technique there? So with this, with the comp committee, the comp committee is a subcommittee of the board. Mm -hmm. And um, so I worked really closely with my CEO because my CEO reported to the board. Okay. So really working in concert with my CEO, and I'm going to use the pronoun him just because in that role, it wasn't him. Um, we would talk about things before, you know, talk about approaches. And then before meetings, he and I, would have a call with the chair of the committee to make sure we're aligned and I could hear from the chair what their concerns were or what they wanted to know. And they could also become very familiar with, you know, what's that fiduciary part that we need to move forward with? What's the what's the work that we need to do? And then, you know, what doesn't make sense? Um, and when you say what's the work, what do you mean by that? Like, so it could be the, at the cycle in which to get um, compensation approved. So that would be the work. Okay, so what market data do we have? You know, how have um, the people performed against their KPIs? What what's needed to move forward so that the um, that the other members can have a good sense of making any decisions or recommendations to the broader board for approval. And how large is the uh, the you know committee generally, or how large was yours? Mine okay. would be about four, four mm -hmm. maybe five people. Okay. Okay. And so the chair, you do a prep call with the chair. Um, did you prep with the other members or was it like the not chair? So not as much primarily with the chair, but if there was okay. something, if there had been questions or concerns, I might reach out to one or two of the members just to say, Hey, you brought up this question last time. Here's the information. Here's what we're going to talk about in the, in the next meeting. But I want to make sure you got your answer question you know your question answered or uh, doing right. the follow-up just so that they could feel like they were prepared ready to go and then the compensation committee um meeting is a whole separate meeting before yes. the big board meeting it, well they go along in the cycles so okay. you have typical cycles of like to like when you're going to approve compensation or in a in a public organization you'd need to go and figure out when when you have to go ask for um, pools of money or equity awards or those kinds of things. So you're going to have those set, but if you have additional um, additional projects going on, then you may have other meetings in throughout the year. And not everything goes to the board because in my experience, the comp committee, the board had delegated authority to the comp committee for quite a bit of things. But when it came to like the CEO comp, or something uh, like when we did a search for a CEO that went back to the board, they would delegate authority, but only to so far. I see. Yeah. Um, so you talked about the CEOs, you know, compensation, obviously, and bonuses, and mm -hmm. um, and his in this case his direct reports. That includes the CHRO in many cases. So how does that work? It does include the CHRO. Well, mm -hmm. you know. 
If you are a CHRO or if you are a total ward, rewards person, I think we know you just know you just know how to handle compensation or you're not going to be at this level. No, but I mean, what about your own compensation? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pay? No, we, yeah. this CEO would work on it. Um, I'd provide him the data along mm -hmm. with it, along with all my peers. He'd put it together. We might talk about it. We, you know, he would typically talk with me about it before um, out of respect, mm -hmm. but it was, if he didn't, it was fine because, you know, it's a, it's another person on the team. And at that point you're acting as a facilitator even mm -hmm. though you're the person who's in the role. So you compartmentalize and you get the work done. Okay. Um, so what other advice do you have for other CHROs who are stepping into this role for the first time or maybe struggling with yeah. the hat that they're wearing? <laughs> um, some advice I have is, and this is something that I learned on my own, so I was in a smaller organization and I really kept most of the work on my own desk. And I would really recommend that you don't do what I did. I would share the wealth. You really have to have, I mean, if you, if you have a strong team, then you have a real good understanding about what confidentiality is and what it isn't. Mm -hmm. um, but I would have had more help. I would have had somebody doing more of the administrative work and I would have had um, other people helping me along the way. In my particular experience, I did have my compensation manager. She and I did a lot of the work, but when it came to the um, doing other analysis and putting that together or the recommendations for my peers or the CEO, I held that really closely. And so I did all of that work together for myself. And so in preparation for a meeting, it could take me 40 to 60 hours. And so 40 to 60 hours of either doing the analysis, getting the materials prepared, doing all the prep calls, there's just a lot of work there and you're juggling everything else. So you're juggling whatever strategic work is, what other programs, managing your team, working as a, a member of the executive team, you've got all of that other stuff going on. And so it made, it made for some really long days. And so I would really encourage you, if you were stepping in or you're doing it now, involve some other people, um, because the other thing, not only does it help you, but it also creates some learning opportunities and you can get to the place where you can delegate, take a time, take some time off uh, and not completely fret over it. Uh, but it is, um, it, there's a lot there. Yeah. Um, the, I would, I would also recommend a couple other things, Cindy, if you don't mind. Yeah. So what I found is, and what you might find the person who might be listening to this is that there's some overlap sometimes on the board. So board members may be on the comp committee and they may be on either the finance or the audit committee or something else. And so they're kind of cross pollinated. And it was really important for me to work closely for my, with my CFO, especially if we had some big decisions coming up, um, because the comp committee could approve one portion of it, but then let's say the finance committee or an audit committee would need to approve the other portion of it. Mm -hmm. So in one case, um, this was back in during the early parts of the pandemic, you know, when no one knew what was coming up. Uh, we took a very conservative approach to compensation, as did many companies. Uh, you know, we decided, well, we'll look at what we're going to do about bonuses. We're not sure we can do that. We probably need to hold on to the cash. And so that was one conversation with the comp committee, but it was also a conversation with the finance committee. And so the CFO, the CEO, and myself, we talked a lot about that and how we would approach that. And I think I think it actually ended up that I talked about it with the comp committee before they talked about it with the finance committee. Um, and it was important because they would have made a decision on the, the comp committee would have made the decision on the allocations and the finance committee would have been making the decisions on how to spend the money out of the budget. Mm -hmm. And if you get into another situation, let's say that the organization, this is a hypothetical, if the organization has gone through something huge let's say they delivered on something that weren't that weren't supposed to or um some some big accomplishment and you want to do some special bonuses that you didn't originally budget for then you may need to take it from another line item if you don't have the revenue 
Um, but you would need to coordinate those decisions again, because one is to think about what does this, what does this reward mean? What does it say? How does it, mm -hmm. how does it impact the organization? And then from the finance committee, I'm like, how are we going to pay for this? Where are you going to find the, where are you going to find the money? And are we good with this? And, you know, does it impact what's the, what's the domino effect? Wow. So a lot to learn. And um, you, you actually came up through for-profit, right? And yes. you had to get yourself up to speed on compensation because did you have much compensation experience in your personal? I had um I had a little bit I mm -hmm. had a little bit I was I wasn't dangerous I had you know you say like I had enough to be dangerous I wasn't dangerous but I wasn't I wasn't as well versed as I became in this role and how did you I mean initially get yourself up to speed because I think there's a lot of CHROs that come up through the business partner path right maybe talent management, uh, uh, and some come up through compensation, of course, but how did you, that's a big jump, right? Big leap and uh, a highly visible role. So how did you, what did you read? What did you do? Did you have mentors, people you could turn to? to get so to um, a lot of times you just need to go out and research it and figure out how to do things. Like early on, I got to uh, put together an annual, uh, annual incentive plan for the senior team. Well, I've never done anything like that before. Uh, so, you know, you just research and you piece it together and you talk to your comp partner and you um, have some sleepless nights and you come up with some ideas and you kind of work through it and, and you can call a friend. Um, but that's really how I did it. And I looked at, you know, you really think about how it can be effective. You talk about it with the CEO, maybe your CFO, figure out how you can and tie everything together because each organization is going to be a little bit different. Yeah. Sorry, I have to put a shameless plug in here. I bet you wish you had the mastermind groups nine years ago, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes, I would have loved the mastermind group early on. Oh, uh, yeah, that would have been really good. That would have been, and I would have said, let me have the hot seat, Cindy. I'm going to take the hot seat for the entire session. <laughs> <laughs> That's, awesome. That's awesome. It would have been, it would have been great. And it isn't a shameless plug. It is um, why uh, masterminds is so needed. Yeah. All right. So tell the audience a little something about you that they might not know from checking you out on LinkedIn. Tell you something that you may not know. Oh, Cindy, I don't know. There's a lot out on LinkedIn. Um, uh, okay. Something personal. You board a lot of dogs. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I am. A, um, I'm very active in dog rescue and we always have an extra foster dog. Okay. So there's always room in the house for one more dog. And you're just coming out of your sabbatical. How I am that? just coming out of a sabbatical. Yep. I transitioned out of YPO and um, knowing that I wanted to go back to a for-profit or to, to go do something else. And so I've had a, I've had a great break and now I'm in the process of looking for my next opportunity. So absolutely. Well, awesome. well so uh, we will drop Melissa's LinkedIn uh, profile into the show notes. So if you want to reach out to her, ask her questions about um you know this experience board. <laughs> yeah exactly uh working with your comp committee she certainly has some of the um the the uh stories to to back up her experience as well as um gosh maybe there's an opportunity that somebody thinks would be perfect for you so yes and um i would really welcome anybody who's listening to this if there's something that i can do to help you please just drop me a note through linkedin um and i would be happy to connect all right. Well, thank you, Melissa, for thank you, Cindy. Thanks. It's yeah, been a prep. It's always good to see you. All right. Awesome.